Welcome back to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Mueller. I'm your host, Brad Wild. Today on the show, another trans widow. There's more than one. Yes, you know about one of the trans widows who's been on the program already. Uh, Tracy Shannon will be with us. Um, she's remarried. Um, she has kids. And she has a new husband. Uh, moving on from what she calls a relationship that was challenging, to say the least. We'll be right back with more here on Unmasking the Trans Movement right after this. Join Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler Sunday, April 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as he hosts Unmasking the Trans Movement's next webinar where we connect you with the clinical professionals who provide understanding on the many topics that make up this disturbing ideology and answer any questions you may have. Protecting the most vulnerable, women and children, Unmasking the Trans Movement. For more info on guests, dates, times, and pricing, see us online at Unmasking the Trans transmovement.com. Welcome back to Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. I'm your host, Brad Wilder. Today on the show, Tracy Shannon is here. John Euler is standing by. Let's bring John into the program right now. John, there is um, a story to tell here. Every trans widow seems to uh, run into therapy, run into therapists as well, who definitely do things that um, cause even more turmoil in a wife's life and and the the direction and path that these people are pushing is deviant all on its own brad there there's such far-reaching implications for all this and that's why i'm so appreciative to have on the program tracy shannon tracy shannon and I go back a little ways. She was good enough to allow me to interview her a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're going to recommend that interview. I think I entitled it, When a Woman is Was Married to Someone She Did Not Recognize, or something along that. We'll have the link below um, in the BitChute and YouTube version of this. So, Tracy, you have shared, and you've been on a number of platforms, Benjamin Boyce, and you have shared uh, some of your story, uh, if you want to just briefly review. But the one thing that hasn't been shared and that is necessary is for people to really begin to understand the, uh, the ongoing trauma. This thing is never-ending. When you are married to a man that you thought you could trust— and then lo and behold, he becomes deviant. There's no other way to put it, that subtly he starts to be, morph into somebody you don't recognize. And what you do recognize, and I remember in the first program you started to say or you shared that you started to recognize you in him. He starts to model himself. He's stealing your clothes, your underwear. I remember that. And then before you know it, there is a morphing process into somebody that you don't recognize. And he also became uh, very uh, mean. He started to gaslight you. So, uh, Tracy, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for being on. We've had Uta Hagen, and now we're having you. And, uh, you know, you're you're one of my heroes, anybody that can survive these things. And we're we're seeing you from your home, and that's absolutely just fine, right? You're you're a mom, and that's part of the compelling story about this. You're you're still trying to live your life, but this whole thing, as we titled the program, it this man has ghosted you because he's still in your life. So welcome, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm well, tell us, uh, for the listeners that may not have an opportunity to go back and listen to your full story, why don't you give a brief thumbnail, uh, you know, link you like that, because I do also want you to share, there's very similar um, themes, as it were, between the counselor that he found for you all, and then the counselor that Uda went to. So... Right. Uh, the, these guys will try to justify and rationalize and gaslight the wives and mothers. Yes. So um, early in our marriage, in the like first four years, I guess, we did experience a little bit of cross-dressing behavior. And um, it was 
very little to the point where back then I wouldn't have really called it cross-dressing. It would have been elements of cross-dressing. And I didn't really even know the word cross-dressing really at the time. But after the birth of our first son, my then husband came to me and said, well, he had a problem with cross-dressing in the past. And so he was letting me know this. And I said, well, we'll go to a therapist then. And so we did. It was a therapist he picked. And at that therapist, she told me I was closed-minded because I was not open to him going out with other men and having these like ladies nights and ladies weekends, having a, his own PO box to get lady things in. And it was supposed to be okay with me as long as it was out of sight, out of mind. And I was not okay with that. Um, so therefore I was called closed minded. She also told me that I must be a lesbian because I was married to this man, had fallen in love with a man that had this feminine side to him. A feminine side I really didn't know anything about. So needless to say, she was not an impartial person. And uh, she told us to go to a bookstore and read some book. And it was supposed to help me uh, become comfortable with my husband doing all these things. We ultimately decided not to continue therapy with her. And he went on seeing her behind my back for the next 11 years. She wrote him a letter to get on uh, hormone therapy or, you know, for him to begin his sex, begin sex change. And he took those hormones for 11 years of our marriage. And the other um, part that I mentioned before in the interview with John was that when we went to court eventually to divorce 11 years later, um, the, the court, uh, you know, trying to be impartial, I guess, and having the effect of the, how the LGBT community has affected every institution in our country couldn't see that there might be some potential harm to my children being left in the care and custody of their father who was uh, cross-dressing and pursuing a, a, a transition of his gender at that time and had already made some really bad decisions including wanting to put them on a pride parade float with a bdsm dominatrix on it um, but I in mean, the past, kids, wanting to put your kids into a pride parade on a float. That doesn't sound very neutral to me. No. And so the court didn't see any problem with this. And um, in the past, before our case in Texas, there had never been a case that was decided for a, a parent who's transitioning to have shared custody of their children. This was a landmark win for the LGBTQ. And for me, it equaled experimentation on my children. And it, it hasn't been without, you know, it's problems for my children. And while every family experiences its fair share of problems, I, I feel like a lot of ours can be directly tracked back to um, the decision to allow him to have joint shared custody with me. Uh, it, Tracy, it's important at this point to speak to those that are uh, inclined to say, well, there, there goes John Euler again. He's anti this or he's phobic or, you know, I hate for bigoted. It, it, this is a good point to remind people that we're not against people. We're not against groups of people. We are for the protection of women and children. So here you have a father who has entered into a deviant lifestyle. I know on the first program, or the first time I interviewed you, Tracy, I had referenced that my hunch was that your husband was into pornography, and you have subsequently indicated that you weren't quite sure at that time some things have come out. But when I just said, so he put them in a pride parade on a float, some people may say, well, there you go, John. You're again being phobic. But the question is this. Those that were participating in that parade, those that were on that float with your kids, did anybody do a background check? You're right. That people want to somehow assume that when adults go into an alternative lifestyle, especially men, that somehow they are moral. Somehow they are ethical. Somehow they aren't accessing porn on a regular and consistent basis that becomes extremely deviant, and you have predators. 
And therefore, here's a father that is apparently so agenda-driven or so into himself and his own lifestyle that he puts his kids onto a float in a parade that increases likelihood that they're going to be accessed by predators. That is not protective parenting. Right. So they weren't actually ever on the float because I put a stop to that when I heard about it potentially happening. But um, that is a really good point that you raised, that that there was this just um, constant theme of not protecting the children, of making bad decisions because he just wanted to fulfill himself and just not using the good discernment that a parent should use. And and that was just one example. Another example was taking them to activities where they are encountering all these grownups who are living out their you know, fetishy lifestyle out loud. So just even at, um, this is going to sound crazy to our haters, right? But uh, they would be taken to this LGBTQ church and the kids knew, you know, what the the flag at the front of the church hanging the rainbow flag meant, but they couldn't tell the males and females apart because like a, a man would be talking to them with this deep voice, but he had long hair and makeup on. And my son ran away from the church at one of those, uh, you know, one of those Sundays that they were taken to that church because he was scared. And I was worried for his safety because this was in downtown Houston. And I was afraid he was going to run into a street. He was just a, a little kid, like five or six years old. So, you know, there just wasn't good um, boundaries uh, that kids in- found and sex toys and, you know, things that they should not have been seeing, you know, in their father's home. And my daughter recently um, told me that one of the things that traumatized her was that her father would watch uh, pornographic videos at night in the living room. Well, she had to sleep in the living room because he didn't have a, a separate bedroom for her. So he was watching that in front of her. And, um, you know, that's just a, a clearly a lack of boundaries and, you know, no one wants to give any scrutiny to this community and they want to act like, oh, this Tracy, is just a as, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I'll go so far as to say this, that a case could be made that that is the corruption of minors. Well, of course it is. You show a child pornography videos, that's illegal. I have men in my sex offender treatment groups right now got about 45 guys, three groups, and having conducted sex offender treatment in prison and headed up one of the standalone high intensity uh, programs for sexually violent predators within the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Anytime we would see that in the criminal history, you're dealing with a pedophile. You're dealing with somebody that was grooming. Think about the average normal adult. They want to make sure that the door is shut if they're a husband and wife. They're wanting to make sure that the kids aren't hearing. Are the kids asleep? Well, instead of doing that, he's watching pornography it right there with his own daughter. Now, do we do we know what his motives were? Well, the question is this. Do, does the burden of proof fall upon us or upon a guy who is watching pornography in the same room as his daughter is trying to sleep. And if that's not grooming, I don't know what is. So it's very, it's extremely concerning because if not him crossing boundaries, that sets the stage for grooming is simply overriding intuition. So it's setting a child up for blurred boundaries, not understanding propriety, not understanding when he or she uh, has the right to say no, what is or isn't normal. In this day and age, probably ever since the 80s, you will not find a man that has a sex offense that was not deeply steeped in pornography prior to offending. I mean, it's just definitely not safeguarding. Um, and most parents would want to protect their kids from something like this and definitely not you know, be playing it in the living room because what if that child does wake up or isn't actually asleep like you thought they were. Or um, I think sometimes she was in, engrossed in a her own video game or something, but uh, you just wouldn't put that on at all. And of course he denies that this ever happened, but I believe my daughter. Of course I'm gonna believe my daughter. Um, even though I I didn't 
think, you know, when we initially discussed that, that he would have been watching that kind of thing. But um, if she says he was, then I believe her. So. Yeah. And, and think about um, if you're an adult a male and you're so into porn that you can't even wait till you you have visitation. You can't even wait for your kids not to be around you. So we have somebody that's significantly addicted to pornography. So therefore he's not thinking clearly. Then my guess is it was more than a studio apartment that he had. It was like a two bedroom house or unit. Okay, so he could have gone into another area of the house and shut a door. Right. Yeah. He could have gone into his own bedroom, which um, if I remember correctly, it did have a, a big screen TV in there um, where he could have watched, I guess, in there. And uh, that's the room where they found the sex toys on the bed where he used to have them sleep with him. So yeah. he brought his pornographic videos out to where his daughter was sleeping. Probably it was probably on some kind of streaming service is, is my guess. Because... So, and as a mother, even as I'm describing this, I'm uh, very much aware, Tracy, what that must feel like to think that here you've tried to shelter your kids, you've tried to protect them over the years, and to think that you know your best efforts were at the very least being undermined by this guy that you trusted at one point in time, and before you know it, now he's he's betrayed you and he's placing your children at risk. Yeah, I think that's one of the main things why um, women who are in these situations, um, other women who are married to men who are cross-dressing or um, attempting to transition, they're afraid to leave because they can, they're can. they afraid for what's going to happen to their kids. They're, they think staying there, they can maybe police the situation or at least know what's going on and, and be able to uh, intervene or stop it from getting really worse and maybe set some boundaries. but. You're so afraid of what's going to happen to your kids when you're not there and they're with the the father by themselves. And what what might happen? What might he expose them to? Who might he expose them to? That is something that's really scary. And, you know, for me, that is a reason why I stayed for many years. That and wanting to believe every time he told me that he wasn't doing that stuff anymore, you know, wanting to believe it, wanting to keep the the family together and and have that really you know, that, that picture perfect life that looked like we had, you know, wanting that to be real. You see, that is so important because people who haven't lived through this and it still hasn't stopped for you, right? Because your ex-spouse has not passed away. He's still in your life. So people do wonder like, well, why'd you stay or what, uh, you know, because it's so subtle. Speak to that, uh, that dimension of it, that how it unfolded and how little by little, a lot of gaslighting was going on. Right. Um, you're always told that it's not what it looks like, or it might be your fault even that they're doing this uh, elements of cross-dressing or full-blown cross-dressing, or they're spending money behind your back and you're finding out about it, or you're finding some clothes tucked away somewhere. And it would occasionally happen in our marriage. And it was you know, a little at a time. And I was told it was because he was stressed. One time I caught him in the act of shaving his legs and he was in a, a full state of arousal. And um, to me, that meant something different than relieving a little stress or um, you know, what I was being told. But you're always told not to leave your eyes. Just believe what I'm telling you. And I think a lot of women in that position I was in do believe it. I mean, what other choice do you have except for go to the divorce attorney, go to family court where um, you're very likely going to end up with your kids spending half the time with this person who doesn't seem to be making the very best decisions. And then he's telling you, I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to do it again. So you you choose to stay because he's never going to do it again. And of course he does. And he gets better at hiding it. And he has a bunch of friends online and perhaps a therapist who helps him get better at hiding it and helps them get more deviant and even helps them to get more um, aggressive towards you. Maybe that's passive aggressively um, and even helps them plan to leave you and leave you in a state of financial ruin where you can't fight for your kids because they've been planning and plotting for years and you've been choosing to believe your husband. 
So it, it does happen very subtly and um, incrementally. And you're just gaslighted. I was told this was my fault because of the lack of attention or affection or the lack of the kind of affection that maybe he wanted back when we were married. And it's not your fault. You know, it, it isn't your fault. Something else has triggered this in them that they pursued at some point, maybe before you were married. It doesn't mean they were born that way. But um, some of these guys have been cross-dressing since they were teenagers, right about the time that their uh, sexual desires were also being developed. And they found that they um, were aroused by women's items like uh, lingerie. And they've continued this, um, you know, fancying those things and getting aroused by um, interacting with those things and seeing themselves as a female. And that is absolutely not our fault uh, because there are healthy ways to deal with stress and healthy ways to deal with not getting the, the amount of affection or the kind of affection that you want in your marriage and uh, blaming your spouse and, and doing something. To me, this is a type of infidelity. So if it feels that way to you as a woman, uh, that is the proper way to feel. You should not feel guilty. Um, if your church tries to guilt you uh, because you want to leave that situation, do not feel guilty. Seek out people who will support you to leave. If your family members try to make you feel bad because like my husband seemed like a really nice person and we had a whole lot in common. And even my family initially was like, you know, a lot of people have some weird, <laughs> weird things that they're hung up on and, and some couples decide to just deal with it. You know, they didn't know how bad it is. And that's what I would tell you that maybe some of your friends that you confide in don't know just exactly how this feels and they mean well, because they don't want to see your marriage ruined, but you're going to need to get away from a person doing this. And at least until He's had a complete conversion and is not, definitely not doing this anymore. And I'm going to say for me, when I know there's bad behaviors in someone's past and something involving addiction, that's that means five years of being clean. And I can say in my marriage, we never had five years of being of him being clean. And I stayed and we had more babies who I love very much. But that just got more people, you know, who are affected by all of this. And I would say leave and get support yeah i would concur 100 percent Teresa, i'll go so far as to say this uh that by the time somebody comes into therapy let's say a spouse because i'm a therapist by trade um and even on my uh, some of the other venues that i i address or that i work in um my contention is this by the time someone is so worn out a spouse, that they are willing to disclose to another person what's going on. So the kind of gaslighting you were on the receiving end of, as well as all this stuff. I would say, give yourself, as you said, give yourself about a six month time frame to where you know at that point, as you're addressing things, so you're speaking the truth in love. Love does not mean nice. Love means being effective. You are effectively communicating boundaries, what is or isn't going to be acceptable. You're going to start addressing this. So by the time a half year goes by, you will be able to determine whether or not there is any measurable significant change, including what you want to look for in an offending spouse, whether they're having affairs, whether they've you know, developed porn addiction, whatever it is you're ultimately going to look for a broken and contrite spirit. But what these guys do, because the more they get into pornography, the more it changes the brain, the more it changes the mind, it changes their soul. They become increasingly narcissistic and self-centered, and they develop the adaptability to manipulate. And you even said it, right? The one thing that some a guy that violates his conscience, really anybody, but in this case, we're talking about a guy, a conscience, our conscience is designed to keep us in check. We keep ourselves in check. If I no longer am interested in keeping myself in check, so I'm doing me, then the only thing left to allow me to be completely self-centered is you and your boundaries. So I'll begin to work you and I'll 
begin to chip away at and cause you to turn the volume down on your intuition. So I'll tell you, I know what it looks like, but it's really not that. You, a woman, right. a wife has to trust her intuition. I would say we need to trust our intuition. And I was um, over over the years you know, trained to, to not trust my intuition. I ultimately went to a good counselor when I was living in Ohio. And that's when I first really started to accept that my marriage was coming to an end and that I had to stop going to him for all the answers. And this was a, a counselor who dealt with men who manipulated their wives. That's what he his specialized in. Uh, he was actually counseling men most of the time who abused their wives. And so he was really good at it just knowing how that affected the wives and knowing that they would constantly believe the wife, that the wife would constantly believe the husband that he's never going to do it again. And so his work with me helped me to um, stop going to my husband to hear what I wanted to hear. And I, I really needed the help with that. I, I needed someone who wasn't my family or my friend to, you know, who was a professional who worked with men to say, here's what I see from working with men all the time who lie to their, their spouses. You're being, you are being manipulated the same exact way. And I would encourage women to get not just any counselor, but a good counselor who has worked with men who betray their wives because they will recognize what's being done to you and can counsel you on how to free yourself from that manipulation. Cause that was the beginning of getting out for me. That's when I started realizing like, I got to scroll a little money away so I can hire a lawyer. And so I started hiding some money in a clock uh, so that I could retain a lawyer when I, when I needed to. And so I'm really thankful that I did see that type of counselor. So talk to us in as as a mother, in your role as a mother, walking yourself back over the years and then to the present day. Tell the viewers what what has that been like? What how has this impacted your kids? It's one thing to know that your marriage is going to end, but it's another thing. Very few of us can understand what it's like to have to tell the kids that the marriage is ending because your father has become sexually deviant and wants to become the opposite sex. Right. I mean, they were just so innocent when all of this happened. And my oldest was super close to his dad. And uh, his dad was involved with some of his activities like baseball and Cub Scouts. And it was just such a, a time that my oldest son was developing and really needing his father there that he felt so betrayed. And there were years of my boys just crying themselves to sleep for years. So most divorces, you get divorced and this is a big crisis and there's a lot of changes. And with the support of your family and with some good co-parenting, a lot of the harm can be mitigated, but not entirely mitigated because divorce is destructive. But you at least stop some of these painful experiences. The, the kids are reassured their dad, they'll see their dad. You cannot reassure a kid that they will see their dad and continue that relationship that they had, or they'll even have the relationship that is their that is their their right to have. It's their natural right to have that relationship with their father. When the father's pretending to be a woman, they're completely deprived of their birthright. And that's what's so painful. These kids know that. And dealing with the um, mental fallout, you know, that the, the emotional fallout of that over the years put a lot of stress on, on me, but the hardest part was really them, you know, just, it, it was such a huge loss and there, there's not really anybody trained in helping children deal with such a great loss to deal with that grief. And no one's recognizing in the psychological field. And I will say, even in ministry, no one's recognizing the grief that these children are going through and helping them navigate that. And so it can be very destructive in their lives. And it has been in my children's life. Luckily, um, uh, we're so blessed that you can't look at my children today and say, wow, you know, there's just, you can't tell that they've been through so much. But they still have a lot to navigate. There's still a lot of emotional waves, you know, even as they start their own families. 
Gracie, there is so much left to talk about. We've just begun to scratch the surface. Would you be willing to stay with us for a second part? As we have, a, I have additional questions. There are issues dealing with your kids that I think people need to understand as far as what kids go through, what uh, grandparents go through, the ripple effect for the family. And you have then found uh, just a multitude of issues that you have had to deal with as far as as you have begun speaking out. You have been on the receiving end of very unique things, finding out that there is a very active agenda in trying to silence the wives whose unfaithful and narcissistic and porn-fueled men who went into alternative lifestyles, that the narrative, everything directs our supposed sympathies to them when they are the last ones deserving of sympathy because they have decided that it is all about them. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot we need to talk about. So would you be willing to stay right there? And we'll pick it up on part two of this episode. You bet. Thank you both. A uh, very compelling story to say the least again. And um, there's more to come. Uh, the journey as a trans widow is something that has effects that last a lifetime and what you've been you know divulging here today um we we've we've heard this sort of story and the similarities of it from others but today tracy brought a whole new world of information with her that isn't typically discussed and we want to salute her for that there's more to come this is Unmasking the Trans Movement with John Euler. Stay tuned. Part two is on the way. Remember, you can find us on BitChute. You can also find us on YouTube now as well under Unmasking the Trans Movement. I'm Brad Wilder. I'll see you next time.